<laughs> right? We're back. The, three, the, the three amigos are back again to talk about some new features, some uh, what's new stuff, some today's topics, which will go into optimizing compositions and some questions and answers. And hopefully today we get a lot of questions and answers, right? Hopefully questions and hopefully we can come up with some answers. That's, yeah. that, that's, 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 that's the goal here at Singular to get questions and answer them accordingly. So no one, we don't confuse people more than we tend to confuse sometimes, but a lot of, a lot of good stuff to go over today. I think that my, I'm excited to go over optimization because I think it's something that comes up a lot. People want to use browser sources in their encoding software and the best, um, uh, experience you're going to have is when you have an optimized uh, browser source, and that's what Singular is, a bunch of browser sources that you're bringing out and compositing over your your um, your live streams um, in, in, as for the purpose of this discussion. So I think, Catherine, help me out here. I guess we just dive right into what's new. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Today, I'm sharing my screen, Travis, so if you want to display that for everyone. Today, we're gonna to talk about Scoreboard OCR. Um, super cool tech partner of ours. We uh, just partnered with them. Um, they've got this awesome software that, I, this blows my mind, frankly, that allows you to take a live video camera, um, place it on, uh, turn it onto a scoreboard, a live scoreboard. So this could be in like, I don't know, your kids, basketball arena, for example, um, and then essentially steal the live data and put it in your overlays. It's it's really pretty awesome. You can kind of see um, sort of the three-step process of how it works in this image, but um, they've got this really great little quick demo video, which I'll show you guys. Uh, let's start from the beginning here. So this I'll is just a live. It's, that optical character recognition, this OCR business, and it's been around a while, but I think to Catherine's point, it's amazing. The amazing fact is that the price points come down so that you can get it into the hands of, of everybody. It's an accessible thing where, um, you know, it's been around, like I said, for a long time, but but at this price point of being able to do what Catherine's going to show you is amazing. I think it's super cool. Yeah, it's great. So what this demo is doing is defining all of the data points that, um, he or she wants to use in their in their live graphics. You can see some graphics on the bottom of the screen here. This is just a quick YouTube video. Um, there's a link in the video description on, um, well, to this article here, and there's a bunch of other links on um, how to actually set it up. So Scoreboard OCR has a great um, little website that shows you how to actually send the data to Singular, how to test it, solve issues. Um, and it's pretty sweet. So that's one of the new things um, in our little world. And then this, oops. Uh, the second thing we have is we just had a beta update. Um, I guess it was Monday, um, yep. where we've added some really cool new features. I think there's three, three to four key new features in beta. Um, so if you check out my screen again, I'm actually in beta right now. So easiest way to get to beta is just beta.singular.live. Um, traditionally, you're at app, but if you want to check out what's in beta, um, you can go straight to beta. Um, so one of the cool things that we've added is this thing called data streams. Um, and you can go over to the data stream manager in beta to check out what's here. We, we've already created a data stream, but essentially what data streams are for is to send high frequency data um, to your overlays. So it, it basically provides a reliable distribution infrastructure um, for high, high speed data at a stable and low latency. Um, and we recommend using data streams for all use cases that require updating data at one hertz or faster. Um, so some of these use cases might be countdown clocks, penalty clocks, um, telemetry data of race cars, geolocations of planes, that sort of thing. So uh, data streams is just really cool. There's gonna be more um, information coming out about that um, when beta moves to app on Monday, I guess it is. Um, and if we head over to the dashboard, let me go to the marketplace. In the resources section, um, there's going to be a data streams composition script example, and it will teach you how to use data streams. It's super cool. 
Um, so data streams is one of the great things that has just come out in data. Um, there's two others. One is we've added some more usage limits on um, a couple different things, API calls and, uh, and data. So just be aware of that depending on your um, subscription level, what, what your limits are. And Stephen, I don't know if you want to talk about, you know, why that's oh. important. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's a tough one because, um, well, I shouldn't say it's a tough one. It's um, a couple of our widgets, for spe <coughs> specifically the Google Sheet widget, which was, um, you know, a lot of people had an uh, interest in it, and we have a lot number of users that are using it, and they're using um, Google Sheets to uh, push data into Singular um, to an endpoint, to a data node, for example. And if that's um, not really managed, uh, I'll say properly, or if it's overused, um, we have some situations where we have maybe, you know, 10 or 12 or, or, or 20, you know, uh, Google widgets in the composition. And you start getting into some pretty massive data loads, um, especially if you're doing it at trying to do it at a higher frequency. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to find that 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 right balance for um, data limits um, on API calls. So, um, yeah, there's it, it's like anything else. So when you're doing significant amount of traffic across the web to a website, um, it's something that we have to manage. So we're taking our first attempt at it, and I think the guys um, in R and D did a a nice job uh, so far. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing what they're, um, how it's going to be adopted and how it's going to be um, handled. I think there's, for the most part, we don't have a lot of users crushing us with massive amounts of data, but we have had a few. <coughs> and I think that's our response has been um, on the high frequency side, as Catherine mentioned, the, um, the uh, data streams, which I'm hoping to do a use case with uh, a drag racing client that we're working with. Um, hopefully that'll be a nice one we can feature here on on a live stream where we can show you how we're going to take the high, um, the, uh, the very low latency data off this drag racing client. Um, so that might be interesting to see. But yeah, wrapping it together, those two big pieces of um, data streams and <coughs> data limiting, data throttling, if you will, is um, are both in beta and will be released. I don't know if we have an actual release date of beta. I think it's pretty soon though, if I'm not mistaken. The it's next week. Yeah, it's on Monday, the 8th. Okay, yeah, it's getting close. So um, I have not used data streams yet. I um, talked to R&D about it, and um, I'm looking forward to using it because I think, um, you know, conceptually I get the idea, and it's it's it should solve a lot of our problems, especially when you get into, like, those things like basketball um, tenths of a second clocks and those types of things. So, um, yeah, excited to see it. Cool. Um, the third major thing that we've added, and this is for enterprise customers only, and I'm not actually going to click on it, uh, and you'll, you'll know why in a second, but it's called audit logs. And what it allows you to see um, as an admin of your account is all of the activity, um, user activity in your account. And that includes, you know, IP addresses. That's why I don't want to show it. Um, but IP addresses of people and their activities. So if it's they've created a composition, deleted something, have had login failures or successes, loads of different stuff. It's a really great way to keep track of your account, uh, especially if you've got tons and tons of people in your account um, that you're trying to manage. So this is great even for like universities and um, you know some of our bigger customers. So the third thing, sorry, the fourth thing that we've added is player support, two new players for our embed codes. Oh, yes. Um, yes. Many people might know, not know about this. I mean, we've we tried to make uh, make it apparent in our last newsletter, but um, embed codes are really powerful, especially in the web, um, and they activate a lot loads of different features like interactivity and adaptivity. Um, so we encourage you guys to test it out and try it. Um, but let me go into an app and I can show you the uh, embed code options. Um, so because we're in beta you'll see that we now support Amazon IBS and Brightcove. Um, so these are not exposed in app, but they will be on Monday. Um, so for more information on embed codes, um, just do a quick search in our support portal. Um, but it all sort of adapts to your different settings and your desired you know, aspect ratio, that sort of thing. And then you're able to grab this and throw it in your website um, and have a nice embedded video player with your overlays. Um, meshed with it so that's it for what's new here um in singular we should move on i guess to our 
main topic, which is Stephen's favorite. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. So the first one is tiny PNG. This is something that I think all of us at Singular use every single day. Um, you can see on my screen, I've got their website pulled up. There's plenty of other um, image optimization websites out there. We just prefer tiny PNG mostly because of the panda. I don't. <laughs> I mean, George, it's not just a panda. His name is George. Yeah, his. That's his name. I didn't know that. I don't see it, it anywhere, but I trust you. Um, okay, so <laughs> I think Suzanne, you uploaded some images here um, in the dashboard to exemplify what. Yeah, so if you uh, hit the inspector button at the top there. So the original one I downloaded is just a standard 4K or HD um, image, and you can see it's three megabytes now. For everyone, that's not really huge, but when you've got a lot of stuff going on in your composition, that can kind of get big. So I did a couple of different things. So I just tinified the, uh, the original one, which managed to get it down to a thousand color bytes. Uh, which wasn't too bad. And then the other thing that we tend to do is we reduce the size of it. So yeah, if you click that one, you can see that it goes from 1920 and I've literally just halved it. And that original size is just, it's tiny. And then again, we put it through tiny PNG and then it shrinks it yet again. So oh, I clicked on the wrong one, yeah. So reduce size, just reduce aspect ratio for yeah. resolution. And then, tiny, yeah. So you yeah, you want to with all your images, right? I mean, if you think about it in the web world, when you're building a website and essentially what you're doing in Singular is building a website with your overlays, with your output URL. Um, when you're building a website, it's standard practice. You don't want to upload tons of massive images because it takes forever to load and it's, you know, it's sluggish. So um, it's always better to have snappy overlays and um, quick load time. So we love tiny PNG. Yeah, tiny PNG is a, is a good one. Um, images are one piece to the puzzle of optimization. And just to touch on that comment that um, Suzanne made <clears throat> on the resolution, I find that a lot of people, <clears throat> let's say they're streaming at 1920 or 720, and they are either 1920 or 1280 in a 16 by nine stream, and they might just inherently think, well, if I'm if I have background images in a 720 um, uh, by 1280 by 720 stream, I need my background Im images to be 1280 by 720. That's not necessarily the case because um, I always go by, just use your eye, you know, really uh, how much compression I get asked, you know, how much resolution should I have? If I'm streaming 1280, 720, should I use my background images at the same resolution? You don't necessarily have to because file size is a, is a factor of um, compression and, and actual file size in pixel dimensions. So, like Suzanne said, sometimes you can knock a background in half or even a quarter. Um, it depends on how you're using it on the screen and you know how much total screen real estate it takes up in pixels. So um, it's sort of a combination of those two factors. But I would say that um, use your eye, could run things through tiny PNG, and if you can't really just tell the difference, you probably just keep adding compression. Um, whether you use tiny PNG or not, I find it very handy um, on a number of images you know, uh, it'll knock file size down tremendously. And you do have the inspector button inside of the Singular dashboard. <coughs> when you have assets that come in, images, there's the I button in the upper right-hand corner where you can um, quickly view um, file size. And, you know, it's a common mistake that I make all the time when you bring in a lot of assets for a project. You know, usually I'll just look in my um, folder or directory structure, whether I'm on the Mac or the PC, I kind of jump back and forth um, to view, uh, files by detail and just take a look at the largest offenders before you import anything into Singular. Just give your, and, and you might say, oh, I forgot this one or two images. It only takes one image. All of a sudden you're waiting and it's loading. And so um, image size is one, one piece to the optimization puzzle. It's not the be all end all. Just because you have optimized all your images doesn't mean you're good to go and ready, you know, uh, you're gonna make a, a perfect, you know, super uh, fast loading composition. Um, there's a, a host of other factors. And I think on your next point, Suzanne, um, subcompositions, which um, yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry, if you want to jump, yeah, if you want to jump in on that one, that's, you know, generally, you know, smaller is better. I, I, I preach this to all of our customers and demos and when I do POCs and, and projects as, um, you know, can, how small can you make it? You know, how many, how many widgets do you need in composition? 
um, how many control nodes, everything adds up, you know, it's cum cumulative. So the challenge is to try to make something as efficient as possible. So usually projects will start kind of big and then you carve away at it and you realize, oh, I don't need it to be so large. And, and like, like Catherine said, it's the same of a, the discipline in building a website. You start with ambitious ideas and then you, you, you can still achieve that, but you have to um, be mindful of load time. Okay, let's, let's, should we dig into soft compositions? Oh yes. There, there, theoretically, there's tons of different things to cover, but we've sort of cherry picked two major topics because, to be honest, like the requirements on optimization just changes on a case by case scenario. It really depends on what you're trying to build. Um, but I've downloaded um, a theme from the marketplace. I'm just going to extract the composition from <coughs> this theme. and. The first point I'm going to make about compositions is specific, sorry, subcompositions specifically, is that these guys right here, all these subcompositions, these can be understood as templates. So we've had a lot of users in our community for no, no fault of their own um, taking, like, let's, let's say, for example, a lower one line. I'm going to take everything out and just show the lower one line. Let's say you need like a hundred different names um, or maybe even 10 different names displayed in this lower one line. Um, sometimes people will duplicate this, this template, essentially this subcomposition out 10 times and then change the contents of the name. Um, and that's not really what Composer's for. Composer is to build, like I said, these, these templates that you can then use inside of your control app, inside of Studio. And that's where you can customize the contents of the overlays, not only with, you know, text, but with images and, and what other, what, whatever other control nodes that you've exposed to the control app. So just remember, subcompositions are templates. So if you, if you think about it that way, naturally, your composition is going to have less um, subcompositions than it would if, if you were duplicating them out and just changing the contents. So let's jump back over to the app. Um, so let's go with this idea that, let's take all these guys out. Let's go with this idea that I want 10 different names on this lower one line. <clears throat> what I do then is I can just rename it, obviously. Name one. What you can do is duplicate it, duplicate it out 10 different times in Studio. So now you're managing all of this, this duplicate information here in Studio, and it's not affecting the performance of your composition, which is what we want. And then you can change out the names, of course, change the contents of the overlay, name three, et cetera. Um, obviously, you can change the name here as well. Um, no one likes to see the word duplicate 10 times. so. Um, and that's that's essentially it for understanding that subcompositions are essentially templates. So just keep that in mind when you're building. Um, and then I think the second one, Suzanne, you can talk speak on this, but it's really about the more nested you get with your subcompositions. Like for example, in this lower one line, I don't have another subcomposition in here. But if I were to add one, um, dig into it add some more widgets, whatever I need. There's additional um, animation set uh, settings on, on these assets inside of this subcomposition. And the more nested you get with animations, it starts to get heavy, right? Am I, am I saying that correctly, Suzanne? Because you're more of an expert on this. Yeah, I mean, not always, but again, it, like you said earlier, it's a case by case basis. Sometimes that you can get like, three or four nested compositions in and you know when you've got that for you know 10 graphics suddenly it's a lot more and you know, it's just something that can be a minefield as soon as you jump into it the more nested you go and each level has like an animation of its own you can sometimes run into performance issues it really it, it can get quite tricky after a while and then also you have to think about how you're building it and if anyone else wants to look at it as well and they've got to navigate through that minefield of okay so what's this subcomposition doing and this one and this desk is doing this and it's it's 
by all means do nest but like just don't go too overboard I think don't go too deep with it. It. Yeah, yeah, I don't I, go I like can't. 20 deep. <laughs> yeah, I, I rarely do I go more than um, uh, two subcomps within, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start obviously with a subcomp at the main parent level of a composition because um, all of your overlays will be in a subcomp. And then I'll usually go one down from there. So basically a sub subcomp is as far as I generally go. There are some exceptions. There are some where you're doing some very specific animations and you need that level of control and you need multiple effectively multiple timelines going down. Um, but, you know, as Suzanne said, don't forget too, you could have um, single and double timeline animations with any, at any level of that sub of that tree. And it can get very complicated to figure where, where you are. Not only that, it can get very complicated in terms of um, uh, uh, where you're scaling things, <laughs> positioning things. <clears throat> I would say that, you know, the same goes true, and I'll just mention After Effects because there's a lot of users out there that use After Effects that it's those types of users that dive into nested to three and four D subcomps in our world. And After Effects calls it a pre-composition where, where we, our verbiage is subcomposition. And it's the same thing in After Effects. I mean, you go down the rabbit hole and eventually it gets, it gets very difficult to figure out where you are and slower to render um, um, on e in either platform. So generally, I, I, I don't, it's rare that I go more than Two subcomps. I think um, I go the most I've ever gone is about three, and that was in the yeah. very early days of, of scripting. So I had yeah. to go like that that second level in, and yep. then then I was like, okay, I've got the animation on top of that. <laughs> so, yeah. but now our scripting has come a, a long way. So I could probably yeah. go back to that composition and read it, and it would load like a hundred times faster. <laughs> All right, I guess I guess that's for. What we're going to talk about for sub compositions like i said it's it's case by case scenario so if any of you have questions about your specific project and um how you can optimize it or if you're running into issues just shoot us a message and we'll help you out so with that um the third tip that we have is to use table and grid widgets these are super important if you are obviously making a table of information you don't want I don't know. You don't want to duplicate out a text widget 40 different times if you've got, I'm not saying anyone has a 40 row <laughs> table, but 20 times. If you have a 20 row table, having 20 different text widgets, that's that's heavy. I mean, that's going to add some more, some more, you know, beef to your composition. So tables, uh, these widgets are designed to essentially handle all of the duplication. Um, Suzanne, do you want to jump into? Yeah. To take over pretty quickly and open up my uh, pre made composition. So, I always think a great example of this is lineups. So, the good thing I've got a table at the moment now, the table widget is pretty straightforward um, and it uses a JSON payload. So, you've got your number, your name, and then each one of these brackets consists of that's one row and then so forth and so that but it means that you know adjusting you know say for instance you really want 10 lines that's quick and easy to do you know and if i show my layout you can see there how long it all goes up to um and then if i wanted to have no spaces between it or if i wanted five spaces or 15 you know it makes it incredibly quick and easy to go into but then if i dive into the, the composition you can see that i only have the number, I have the name, um, I have the background and anything else. So if I wanted to add anything else into this, like, you know, um, a shirt color or something like that, I could do. But also changing color becomes infinitely faster. So, so for instance, your client goes, oh, I no longer want it black. I want it to be this kind of dusty color. You can just change it once, come back out, and that then affects it across the board on all of those. So if I change that to like a red color, you would see it like instantly because I've changed it to a fairly off color. Um, but it's really quick and easy to kind of change everything up and add stuff in. Um, the other one, which is great, is the grid widget. Now, this is the grid widget. I'm just gonna make it slightly bigger because I don't think it's very... So what the grid widget and how the grid widget is different is that you have columns and rows, whereas the table widget, you only have um, 
you only have a singular column, but this one you can have columns and rows. So I've got two um, columns here, if I increase that to three, and then I'm just gonna show that. So you can see that you can build things out very quickly, especially um, if you have, um, oh God, what's the word, the brackets, you know, you could use a, a grid system for a bracket. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's, I believe in the marketplace, do we have some examples? Um, I'm sure we do of a, a, a table in, in use because the the one thing that's sort of a gotcha is the payload payload I is, don't you know, think that we we do that's something that's a resource we need to add but there are links in the description for um yes. information on table widgets and grid widgets so feel free to check those out um, and then also really quickly when you're adding widgets to your composition that you don't quite understand um, there's a green question mark that appears and you can click on it. It'll send you to the article um, describing it and you can give us a down vote if it makes no sense to you and we'll <laughs> make it better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, to be fair, whenever I get a table widget, I automatically hit this and just copy like the first section because it has all the bracket systems in there. It's yeah. just easier than trying to remember it from scratch. Yeah. But I mean, the only downside about using um, a table or a grid widget is animation, because instead of having like a row by row basis, they're all just kind of appear at once. Um, that is the only downside is the animation, um, especially if you have a, a really nice After Effects where it has like row one coming in, cascading um, or something like that. Doesn't mean that you can't do something fun with it, but you'll, it's always going to come in as one big. Um, I feel like I've seen some creative approaches to solving that um, challenge. Maybe. maybe well, that, yeah, with the update animation. So if you send the, the, the table or the grid are, are both um, designed to receive a JSON array of data. Um, so <clears throat> that's not. Um, it's a little more advanced. I, I don't think it's 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 a pretty straightforward uh, array structure. Um, but if you <laughs> if you use update animations, excuse me, update animations, and you send a payload in the array where you blank out everything out, so now you have nothing appearing. And then when you send the first load of data, you can cascade the the animation down. So it's not timeline animations; it's update animations on new payload. So on a new payload, if you send nothing, you're going to have no table. You send the first page, and you'll have um, but yeah, very, very efficient. Um, again, it's another one though, to be careful, you know, if you use a table or a grid multiple times across a composition, it can get heavy too. There's a lot going on in a, um, in, in the widget itself, the table and grid widget. Um, and those are, uh, but very powerful. I use them quite a bit, quite often, usually with the Google sheets too. Google sheet is a, is a, yeah, That's it's one of the ones that you'll most use the, with the Google Sheet as a table widget. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, or if someone's sending you like um, a data stream or something like that, you know, you've got a JSON coming at you, so you just hook it up. It's, it's a good way of doing it. And it's also, it's, like I said, it's a very fast adaptive way of being able to tweak and change it all. So it's definitely one of the more common ones that we use, isn't it? Oh, yeah. All right, cool. Um, the last, is it the last? No, we have five. Um, the fourth one, fourth tip that we have is if you're ever using video, um, we highly recommend that you use WebM format. Uh, it's designed specifically for the web. Um, most people probably, you know, default to using MP4. That's totally fine. Um, MP4 works perfectly in our video clip widget, um, but we still do recommend using WebM because it. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it optimizes the compression a lot, or it, it is compressed a lot more than a WebM or a MP4 file. Is that right? Yeah, generally speaking, and, and it also supports transparency as well. Um, we've had great success with uh, WebM um, and WebP. WebP is the, uh, the image, still image version of that compression uh, Kodak suite, I guess, from um, that came out a number of years ago, but it's, um, We've had great success in a number of clients using WebM. Um, it's amazing yeah. how much it compresses and, and you look very loss of, uh, low loss of quality as well. Just a quick reminder too, um, we don't currently support hosting video files on in the dashboard. So you'll have to grab your um, URLs or public URLs from your own 
uh, servers. And I say public because Singular needs to have access to be able to render out your videos. But um, I think usually though, um, our customers like using video clips more for like backgrounds and you know subtle animations, that sort of thing. Um, in that instance, we try and encourage people to use the body move in widget. Um, it, you can you can look it up to learn, learn more. We're not going to dig too deep into it, but um, it essentially takes like a JSON uh, body movement payload from After Effects, for example, and re-renders it in um, in Singular. So it's just kind of a, a a step down, or I guess a step up from from using video. It's I think it's a little bit more optimized for Singular. Yeah, for a lot of things, if you're just moving some some basic geometric shapes, for example, in a background <coughs> patterns and those types of things, um, body moving is, is is a very efficient way of of getting a um, you know all the basic geometrics that you do in After Effects, um, position, scale, rotation, um, masking, that type of thing when you're moving masks around, <coughs> you can render that out with the body moving um, add-on. Um, plugin, if you will, in After Effects. And then you have a file. And then we have two widgets to play back that JSON, either in a loop or just once. So um, I've used them quite a bit uh, on and off. It's for more advanced animations, whether they're full screen backgrounds like Catherine mentioned, or uh, maybe animating on a little bit more elaborate lower third where you find our timeline animation maybe a little bit uh, limiting. Um, that's where we encourage people to go. Um, cool. Guys, was that Travis yeah. hitting us with a question? No. I thought I saw something pop up about widgets and who builds widgets, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, I'll just touch on that. I'm pretty sure I saw a little thing pop up about widgets. Um, you know, we do have a, a, a number of customers that build their own widgets. Um, we have a really, um, I think it's one of those things that I don't think people are aware of, but in, in the, um, all of our widgets are built in JavaScript and there is a, a pretty robust, um, I'll call it the sort of backend management tool that we have for deploying widgets, um, deprecating widgets, um, being able to use, if, for example, if you get into developing your own widget <coughs> using scripting, you deploy it into your account, your account specifically, um, where you can have maybe two versions at the same time in the same composition because you're testing against them. Um, like I said, you can, you can, there's a deprecation feature in there. Um, you can revert back to older widgets that are published into your account. Um, I don't think the purpose of this this stream was to go into that, but um, it's definitely something we should dive into and probably get one of the R&D guys in because it's tremendously powerful. Um, but yeah, most of them we build, but there are a number of our customers that build them for their own specific use cases. Like they might have a widget that they need that built in the widgets they're um, requesting data, for example, or their um, building an entire uh, lower third graphic. They just drop the widget and boom, it's done. I've seen that done or um, percentage bars, that types of things, <clears throat> a lot of examples. I mean, the, the widget library is quite extensive. Um, you know, we, we get the advantage on the singular side to see them all um, within our team. So um, the ones that are in the base package for new accounts uh, is, is quite robust, but again, we're adding them all the time when we find one and we really, you know, put it through its paces and then release it and it goes throughout everyone's accounts. So, um, but it's, the, yeah, it's, it's all done in JavaScripting and, um, you know, all the widgets are in JavaScript. Now, I don't know if you can show the dev versions as a, as a general user, that might be something that's only exposed to us. Well, if you have dev access, I believe when you build a composition down at the bottom, you can see which version of a widget you're using down at the lower left hand corner of the composition. And then at any point you can um, go up or down a version, which I've had to use extensively with some of our R&D guys where we're developing a widget that does a very specific thing. Um, and we can, you know, go up and down a version, <coughs> which is really powerful. None of this rebooting the local application. And I mean, a lot of, yeah. Graphics platforms out there, you know, if you're desktop based, you know what I'm talking about. It's basically you're deploying a plugin, you're putting it into a folder, you're shutting down the application and opening it back up so that it gets loaded into memory. And boy, is that a big time waster when you're developing new feature sets. It's very, very difficult. Um, so in singular, that is eradicated. 
All right. Very quick and easy. Sorry, Susan. I was going to say, it's just really quick and easy. You can see that I've got the text yeah. switch up because, you know, you can push it into development to see if anything's changed. Um, or you can take it back to archive and then if you notice it, you know, you can then just publish it to the newer version and nothing's changed on screen for you. It still yeah. works exactly the same as what it was before. <laughs> the text doesn't really change, does it? No. All right, our last tip is um, to take advantage of scripting. Um, we had a recent, I think it might have been our last live stream or one prior to that, where we dug into composition scripting with um, Thomas. But mm -hmm. um, for today, we've got, we just published a resource in the marketplace, a composition script. We're gonna have more of these, I promise. These are gonna be really helpful for advanced users. Right there, yeah. Um, certain scripts, in a way, they optimize your compositions. So this one, it does a lot of different things. It does dual font weights inside of one text widget. Um, it adds two control nodes for this one text widget. So it would be for the first font, one control node for the first font weight, one control node for the second font weight. And then naturally there's this auto, func auto follow functionality built into it where you've got that second font weight constantly following the first um, right after the space. So um, the reason I say that this is an optim this is something that optimizes your compositions is that you're getting a lot of functionality out of one text widget. You don't have to have two text widgets for two different font weights. Now that might seem like, okay, you know, one less text widget, that, how is that really gonna make an impact? But if you're using scripts similar to this throughout your composition and you use them frequently, it, it can add up the amount of text widgets and other things that you're cutting out of your composition essentially. So Suzanne's gonna is this, this. Is this the one where we're using HTML? Or we're taking yes. the text and wrap. Yes. Yeah, this one's pretty cool because um, you know, the text widget, for example, there are a number of properties that you can control within the text widget. And the most common of them is obviously the text itself, the text property within the text widget. So what this script does, and you said we've deployed that one into our Catherine, correct me if I'm wrong, that one's deployed into the marketplace, that example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In it's the a resource. great one. Mm -hmm. It's a great one because you know you have um uh, two control nodes, and what we do is we take those the, the data that's entered into those control nodes, goes into the script, right? It gets picked up by the script, and the script then takes them, and um, we basically can, uh, I don't know the best word to use, we, uh, I want to use the word them. inject, join them, yes, exactly, using uh, HTML, and then the sky's the limit, and it's a really good example, because it's doing multiple things, if I'm not mistaken, that one's doing an auto scale, and we have a background, um, we don't do have a background, but you can add okay. one. You can add a back. Yeah, there's a, a background option in there. So if you have a little bit of web chops, you'll you'll it'll click pretty quickly. Um, I use that one extensively. I used it all this week on a project, um, actually on two projects where I was needing that bold and lowercase font next to each other um, and that auto scaling functionality. So it's a great one. But like you said, Catherine, we've got the sky's the limit. We have so many great examples on our R&D side and <laughs> with Thomas, as you mentioned. Um, we will be getting those out into the marketplace because um, that's where you really start uh, doing some some that next level of, of, of uh, control within a composition. Yeah, Suzanne, do you want to um, dig back out into the regular composition just to explain if, if you guys aren't familiar, you can't really do this. The reason there's a script is you can't do this with just a regular text widget. So. Um, if you, if she's going to dig into the text widget here, um, if you click on it, yeah, right there, you can't just like select, all right, I want the first name to be bold and the last name to not be bold. It affects all of your styling, affects everything, um, exactly. in that text widget. Now you can do your own custom HTML inside of it, but that's just, it's not really realistic because are you going to, are you going to rely on your operator? to also use HTML when they're operating. I mean, you could, but it's it's tedious um, and yeah. there's a lot of room for error. So that script removes that need for your operator to actually do any sort of script, uh, HTML scripting themselves. And they just have the control nodes that they need exposed to them. Um, so you as an artist can handle and control, you know, all of these different parameters um, inside, of the inside of the composition script with, with this specific script. 
And like Steven said, we're going to release a lot more um, for font styling. Um, we're going to release one for data streams, uh, all sorts of different stuff. We've got a lot um, in the pipeline. So make sure to pay attention to the resources section. Yeah. The one thing to mention, though, is as you're building this, um, you're not going to see what you script in the composer. You're only going to see it in the script editor. So, ugh, sorry, that's my bad. Um, so even though you're doing it in the script editor, you can do it on the script editor, but just be aware. Um, I think the skies over the UK just opened up with a torrential <laughs> rain and, and hit the <laughs> hit the roof too hard or something. Yeah. It happens. Um, I mean, I think that's it for our, our tips. We can move on to... Yeah, to Suzanne's point, that is a, that's a very good point about the the composition. I think it's, um, for first time users, or you know, you you expect maybe you're to see this um, real time. I don't even you want to use the word real time, but the effect that the script takes place, um, the things that you do in script editor will should will be displayed in the script editor itself. It takes again a little getting used to. It's basically you have your very base composition. <coughs> you open up the script editor, and you can have a script dedicated to any sub composition. You can have um, a, a, a root level script. Um, you can have, uh, uh, gosh, I lost my train of thought. Um, at the root level, you can have a script. Suzanne, what else? At the overlay level, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yep, overlay, so root, yeah. overlay, global. They're, yes. they're the three main ones. The global one, I'm excited to get some more out there because in the global one, for example, you can do things, for, um, I have a, sports customer that has um they use tri codes so they just want to type in you know uh, sfg san francisco giants for example and in the global section of that script you just have all of the pertinent information about a specific team maybe their color primary color and you can call the global script and assign that data to a specific sub composition script so we'll definitely get those kinds of examples into the um marketplace because they are really really powerful um and it saves a tremendous amount of time if you're uh, in, in the data entry side in studio or if you're making your own custom control app. So I'm excited to get more scripting out there because I think it um, it shows off the best of singular when you have a, a script or scripts plural attached to a composition. And we use them a lot. Yeah. Um, so what Suzanne, Suzanne was saying before her computer shut down is um, any sort of scripting that you do in the script editor here, this is where you can access it, this button. It's not going to preview in your composition. It's going to preview inside of the script editor. So if you make changes in the script editor and you're back in, in your composition and you're like, why aren't they reflected um, in, in my preview window? It's, it's because of that. So just make sure to remember that. Um, and make sure to hit save in the script. That's the, yeah. one pla that's the only place we have a save button. Much like if you were in Google Sheets, and you were making a script, you need to save. So like, for example, if I just change a couple of things and I click exit out, it's gonna give me an alert to save it. So just, well, I just left, but um, <laughs> I didn't do anything important. Save is up here on the left. So just hit save. I think that's, um, that's kind of like a fail safe thing, right? Cause you don't want things kind of automatically updating every mm -hmm. second, like we do with when we save in Composer. I think you want as a as a scripter to be able to say, all right, I'm going to work on this for however long, and then save it, then deploy the script instead of it being deployed every you know every it's, letter. It's much typing. exactly. It's much in the same relationship that you have in Google when you have Google Sheets um, and you have a, a spreadsheet in Google Sheets, and then you add a script on top of it, and you do functionality and different um, um, calls. Maybe you're collecting data in a, a import feed, input HTML uh, functions within a Google. A script attached to a sheet. Uh, it's the same type of relationship that I have in Singular with a composition and the graphic elements and the additional functionality, which is the script, the logic, the calls to get data, for example, or, or do an example that we gave earlier, the, the text injecting the, or replacing the text that gets put into a control uh, field into a string, um, into an HTML uh, uh, format. So, we're going to get more in there. That's the goal. We have them cool. lined up. Travis, do we have any questions? Or did we already answer that one that came in? I think he's muted. Otherwise, nothing? 
All right. Well, quiet we Thursday. Oh, we do. Someone planted that. I'm typing up one of our questions that we, we got in. Can you say that again to me, Travis? You guys can't hear me. But... Well, I can take a I yeah, I mean, no, uh, for one thing, you can have multiple data, data nodes within a composition. Do you need that? Not necessarily, but that's option number one. You can, I'm, in some projects, I might have uh, two or three data nodes um, just for organizational purposes, just to compartmentalize things. Um, but you can, uh, if you only have one data node, and let's say you have multiple uh, arrays coming into that data node for table widgets, for example, um, you can um, add that data node, say at the root level of a composition, and then in all your subcomps, attach which pieces of the data you want off of the data node, if that makes sense. Um, do, we have, do we have anything quick that we can share, Suzanne, or is that kind of a deep, deep dive? Um, of multiple data nodes. Uh, give me a couple of seconds. I think it's one, it's one data node, right? And then just grabbing different data, uh, different lines of data and spreading it throughout your composition right yeah okay. so um i don't i don't have a specific one that i think i can i have straight away but i might do okay um whoever asked that feel free to reiterate that question in our support portal and um if you've got a specific use case case which i'm sure you do um you know send mm -hmm. us a link and we can help you out but um it's definitely possible yeah, if you're sending if you're if you're sending in like a bunch of data that you're going to attach to to control nodes, for example, into a, if you're sending into a data node, you got a big long list of of control nodes, and it, uh, maybe what we're getting at is you want to take a certain block of those that that data from the data node, assign it to subcomp one, and another one to subcomp two. Um, you know, all the data that hits the data node is available anywhere throughout the composition, obviously. So it can be assigned anywhere. So in some cases, I put the data node maybe, at, again, at the root level. And then what pieces I need off of that data node, I will assign them on a, uh, within each subcomp. Um, so all of the data hits the sort of the global, I shouldn't use the word global, at the global, the highest point of the composition tree, at the top of the scene tree. <laughs> And then I dive into my subcomps and assign data that's coming in accordingly. Um, because when you when you cl click on a property, for example, if you put a data node at the top of a composition tree, and then you, let's say it's text coming in, and then you're in your subcomp, and in your subcomp you have the text widget. When you click on the text widget to assign it, you can select root. Right, the data the data nodes up here at the root level, you can you can go get the data from above it. So if one place up here gets the data, then you can distribute it below. I hope that makes sense. That might be one more. <laughs> Hopefully, whoever asked that will post that support call. We can even. Um, um. So I do actually have a example of that. All right, we got ten minutes. Let's see if we can do it. All right, Heaven. Um, my screen's readjusted very quickly. So. Oh, um, good. It's back. Um, I can't find where my Zoom. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Let me share screen three instead. Okay. So here we go. This is a. Um, just a demo. It, this is a huge one, but you can see here that I've got T2 and um, up to T1. So that's like team one, team two. And I've got a, uh, a, a crawl going here. Now, I haven't opened this in a while, so it's probably not going to work very well. But I've also got all the names that I'm pulling from to hit these, uh, these data nodes that are at the root level. They're all at the same place. 
here. So you can connect them from different places constantly at the same time. So you don't have to have um, that you can have um, them linking at the right place. So if I just trigger that one in, which apparently is Man City. Um, and then if I trigger in, let's go lineups, because I've got, I've got several ones here that are, there you go, you've got your lineups there. And then if I go so now this is for multiple different data nodes, right? Um, so this this is just for one. Um, it's not connected right now. But what I would do is for this one is I just go to my root control nodes or sorry this guy here, and then I can look for the the data node and add in everything that needs to be in there. Mm -hmm. um, again, you could do this with a couple of different ones. So you could add in say a Google Sheet for you know just the home. You could have another i say google sheet a data node for home you can have for away anything like that um you could even have one for standings or anything like that and we did do that before. um or if you have like concurrent games you could have like someone sending data to game one or game two or game three and you can have those as different data nodes that's another way that we've used it in the past um but this is just how you can link you know i've got you know, formations, I've got our lineups and I've got um, a lineups crawl all being fed by the same data. Yeah, so it's very, I guess it's very similar to like, well, I don't know if it's similar to control nodes. It's just, you can access one data node data anywhere. So you can use it in every single overlay if you want. It's really, um, I don't know, it seems very optimized to do it that way. So it, in a way, it's kind of smart that you're only feeding your composition from one data node, and then you can just pick and choose what you need. Um, are there ever instances, Suzanne, where you use multiple data nodes? Or um, Yeah, the, the, there can be someone you do use multiple data nodes. Like I say, if you've got concurrent games and you're using, say, for instance, Google Sheets, um, mm -hmm. you'll just say you'll set up like a an attribute so someone just goes right this is game one and everyone has to turn to page two or say for instance they're using a, a um a control app um if they're using a table page one will always be for the data that's um for game one page two is for game two, two and page three is for um all the data that's coming from um game three and so on like that uh, the other way is you, you can do it was we did this a really long time ago with a client where we had like it, it was just multiple tables set up where we had fixtures here. Um, you know, we break the screen down into sections and we had several different data, uh, data nodes going to each different section so they could update individually rather than yeah. all at once, um, mm -hmm. which is how they wanted to set it up. That's smart. Um, but okay, yeah. is that that's it? That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. And I'm excited about Monday when we release the new version. Um, I know the guys have put a tremendous amount of work into this this latest one, and um, I uh, yeah, next week should be a, another big milestone for us with a new release. And um, yeah, keep those questions coming, and we will keep marching forward with Singular. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.